Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent read for four books I read in the past week or week and a half and one that should have been in last week's uh, but I completely forgot about it uh, which is not a comment on its quality by the way. Okay so uh, the books we're talking about today are The Silentary by Antonio Di Benedetto, uh, an Argentinian author, uh, translated by Esther Allen. Then The Membranes by Taiwanese author Chi Tai Chi Ta Wei and translated by Ari Larissa Heinrich and I think this was um, listed for this year's Man Booker International uh, even though this was written in 1996 it's only just been translated into English uh, last year hence it qualifies. Um, a poetry collection called The Sun is Open by Gail McConnell uh, from Northern Ireland. Um, Dark Neighbourhood, a collection of short stories by Vanessa Onur-Mezi, apologies for butchering the name. And the book I forgot last week uh, to talk about, The Book of Portraiture by Steve Thomas Sula. So I'm going to start with The Silent Tree and I'm going to start by reading uh, the blurb. Uh, the Silent Tree takes place in a nameless Latin American city during the early 50s. Yup. A young man employed in middle management entertains an ambition to write a book of some sort. Yes. But first he must establish the necessary preconditions. Blah, 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 blah. But then it says, he thinks upon, he thinks of embarking on his writing career with something simple, a detective novel, and ponders the possibility of choosing a victim among the people he knows and planning a crime as if he himself were the killer. That way, he hopes, the book might finally begin to take shape. So that's half of the blurb. And it's true that that's in the book, but the first mention of it is three-fifths of the way through over the space of about two pages. And then it's referred to a couple of times in a couple of paragraphs until the end. That is not what this book is about. That blurb completely um, does not justify what is actually a very interesting book. So as it says, it's a middle manager uh, with ambitions to write a novel and um, he is frustrated at every turn in sort of true Thomas B Bernhardt style uh, by noise pollution that where he lives there are increasing penetration of small businesses uh, repair shops and uh, construction things or, and you know sort of conversions of buildings into little sort of home factories all this sort of stuff so he can't find the stillness and the quietitude that he needs to sit down and write. And um, he tries to do battle with these businesses uh, through legal channels, through the local council and through consulting lawyers. But it's no dice because they say, well, you want to deny these guys uh, try to earn an honest living. You're some sort of class snob because this is working class uh, people. Uh, and he's going, no, but this is a residential area. There, there should be zoning regulations. And, and he's defeated at every turn. That's the first third of the book. And it's a very tersely written style that Benedetto has. And that sort of cranks up in quite a sort of, you really feel it as the, as the reader. You feel this guy's frustration, um, you know, that he's thwarted at every turn. That he can't find a peaceful corner, you know, to, to, to write his book. So he can't take it head on, so he decides he's going to try and outrun it. So he goes on the move with his wife and his mother and um, the mother's piano, which goes everywhere with them, even though she never plays it. It's a silent piano, the silent tree, uh, in sort of true John Cage fashion. Um, and even his wife, going back to part one, is um, these two sort of uh, high school girls uh, are always in each other's company he fancies one but i will only sort of message her by talking to the other the one he doesn't fancy that he's i don't know quite whether he's sort of too proud or, or or whatever but he won't directly confront the one that he would like to to date and when they're of an age because he has no relationship with the one he'd like to date but has a, a talking relationship with the one that he doesn't he ends up marrying that one he ends up marrying the proxy um even though that's not that's not the you know his 
heart's desires but because of his sort of self-imposed silence silence towards the other one that's what he ends up doing anyway so they they, they, they go on the road they go to the countryside and lo and behold the cottage they they rent there's a blacksmith next to it so he still can't escape the sound so they lead they then lead a peripatetic existence going from hotel to hotel to hotel and there's always something interfering and gradually you realize that the silence and the stillness that he seeks is not being um usurped and undermined by external factors although there is noise pollution but he can't find the inner stillness in himself of course that's why he can't sit down and write and then we get into changing. Uh, so he had this sort of grand epic um, novel in mind called The Roof, which is a recurring metaphor in the book. But then he decides, well, maybe he should start with something simpler, which is what the blurb says about this detective novel. And should he enact a murder in order to inhabit the character and all that sort of stuff? He ends up in, in prison. And then we get a rather unsatisfactory sort of... Um, Sort of re religious vision changing his whole outlook on life and notions of stillness and noise through a religious filter so the ending wasn't great but there was enough in there and it's written in such a style that it really cranks up the frustration that you can feel as i say it reminded me a lot of thomas bernhard with a couple of books where he has characters trying to sit down to write um so i gave it four stars and onto the membranes um, by Chi Tawei. So this was a fabulous five-star uh, sci-fi dystopian book, a uh, bit like The Matrix, uh, but so much more to it. You know, it's 136 pages, and it packs in a lot of different issues, a lot of interesting ideas. So um, the, the 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 whole of the ozone has rendered uh, the surface of the Earth pretty uninhabitable. Uh, mankind has retreated to the uh, ocean floor. But obviously there is a membrane protecting them from the oceans crushing the, the, the structures in which people live and in fact membranes is is um, an image that is repeated in lots of different ways which is one of the things I really liked about this book it wasn't just a book of ideas that actually on a, on a sort of imagistic uh, stylistic level it's done really well as well and uh, in this community um, there is a beautician um, who is called Momo, um, who is the main character, and we follow her, that basically the book starts at the point at which she is about to be visited by her mother, who she hasn't seen for 20 years. And then we get a lot of flashbacks and, and stuff um, to get us to this point of, you know, why, why she hasn't seen her mother for 20 years and all her relationships and how she achieved everything on her own. You know, she went away to study to be this beautician and then she set up her own business and she became one of the, the, the most renowned uh, beauticians. She has this uh, sort of secret uh, technique of what's called M3 skin. Again, another membrane where it's a layer of skin that goes over the body to sort of protect and to look beautiful um, and it gets peeled away once a week and replaced by another one. But one of the things about it is that it remembers everything that the body does. It's like a sort of um, a recording device of all the body's movements beneath it. Um, so the, there are issues of surveillance and privacy. There's issues obviously of environmentalism, uh, identity, uh, memory. Or you know, there's so much packed into this in a, in a brilliant way, and I don't want to talk too much more about it because of spoilers. Um, but I will just say one thing is, uh, you know, it's built up that this mother has neglected her for 20 years, not made contact. You know, so we we you know we're down on the mother at the point at which we're about to meet her, and when we do meet her, we realise that actually she's been doing the best she can as a remote mother given the circumstances that forced her into that position that actually she has devoted her whole life to remote mothering uh, but her daughter doesn't know this uh, and doesn't realise this and it reminded me a bit in the way uh, in Emma Donoghue's room how the mother there sort of protects the child by creating this world when they're both in a you know being kept in a, this sex perverts basement this sort of had similar vibes but it was far superior because they didn't particularly like room this, you know, as I say, I can't really speak too much more about it because of spoilers, but it's superb. Five stars. And there's an interesting uh, historical note in the back about the history of 
modern Taiwan, uh, when martial law was lifted in 1987. There was a sort of flourishing of the arts, but up till then a lot of sort of underground sort of imports of movies and stuff like that suddenly got fused with you know the the um, the native uh, sort of talent and artistic of which uh, this guy is one of the uh, leading uh, lights in that um, and he writes a lot of um, I think he lectures but he also writes on um, sort of queer themes and there there are very very interesting queer theme, themes in here again I can't talk about it without spoiling um, but very entertainingly done in here so I found that historical note very interesting and you know this sort of mixture of punk and cyberpunk and hybrid art and sort of pirated art from the west which sort of gets butchered in translation but that all feeds into this sort of mosaic of, of the art scene from Taiwan from which this and other things emerge so absolutely fascinating and on to The Sun is Open by Gail McConnell I saw someone talk about this on Twitter not a booktuber uh, I think someone from Northern Ireland because this uh, collection comes from there where Gail McConnell is the daughter of a man who was murdered by the IRA during the Troubles and not just any man he was the governor of the Mays prison one of the infamous H blocks prisons uh, which had um, prisoners from from both sides of the the secular uh, the sectarian divide both Protestants and loyalists they were the ones who sort of say we're not common criminals we're political prisoners therefore we should have rights such as being able to wear our own clothes you had the dirty protest you had the hunger strikes you know it was that prison uh, he was the governor of there and uh, the IRA uh, sent him death threats saying they were going to bomb his car and one day when he was checking underneath his car he was actually shot you know it was a, it was a sort of dastardly um, trick and um, this book poems is based on a lot of found um, writings partly from her father because what she has left of him was all collected in a box marked dad including his his journals when he was a student at the university and stuff and whenever she has people around to visit her she turns the box round so that people can't see it says dad she turns that to face the wall and it's a very measured careful reasoned response this is not a grief and misery set of poems but every so often the pain and the grief just bursts out it's all the more shocking so there's one poem which is uh it sort of intercuts lines from the official parliamentary inquest into his death and the ira statement claiming responsibility for it absolutely chilling so effective but on a much simpler level there's a poem where i don't you know if you're not familiar with the Northern Ireland accent, it's not quite as soft and lilting as the Southern Irish accent. It's quite harsh on the ear, you know, when spoken by some Northern Ireland residents. And she recalls a uh, sort of call and response that she used to have with her, her dad, where they would both draw out each other's names. So it would be Daddy and Gail. And just that really got to me. I mean, that was, you know, I, you know, because I've written a book set in Northern Ireland, I can hear the voices, and uh, yeah, that absolutely, um, you know, that was a bursting out of grief and pain, which sort of shocks you because it it sort of comes it not comes from nowhere, you know where it comes from, but in terms of the rest of the the collection, which is not at that pitch, but when it emerges, it's quite primal and shocking. A lot of the poems are in fully justified uh, box blocks of text uh, again maybe um, echoing the fact that she's you know drawing on stuff from this box um, and also any time that there's um, found material incorporated into a poem it's in grayscale and you can refer to its source in the back where there's a list of all of these so very well put together collection very affecting four stars and on to Dark Neighbourhood. As I say, a uh, collection of short stories. And last week, I, in my roundup, I reviewed uh, Kate Folk's collection called Out There, which is the first short story collection I'd read in two years, having sworn off them after reading Carmen Maria Machado's uh, Her Body and Other Parties. Uh, I will post the link again to that because some of what I'm going to say is going to repeat that. Uh, the points I made in that and why I have problems with short story collections but when I sort of stated how Kate Polk uh, Kate Folk's collection had sort of 
put sent me back. I, you know, I wasn't going to read short story collections again. I was going to revert to my original uh, avowal. Um, Bob Black, one of my uh, uh, viewers and commenters, said, "No, no, you must read this. You must read this. This will change your mind." And um, so I invested in it because uh, you know Bob was so passionate about it. And it's a mixed bag, I have to say. The first thing to say is the language is very lyrical and poetic and, and beautifully done. So the language is wonderful to read, but that in itself is not enough for me in any short story collection. Um, what I would go on and say to illustrate the problems with short story collections, and again, referring back to some of the points I made in my uh, Her Body and Other Parties video, I'm going to talk about two two of the stories here, which I think show the juxtaposition of of what's good and bad about short stories. So the first one is called um, Green Afternoon, and starts and and um, Onur Mwezi lives comes from London, lives in London. I assume of Nigerian extract with a name like that. Um, a a protagonist. Uh, opens their front door to find uh, a dying boy in the garden who's been stabbed, which if you're not from England, there is an absolute epidemic of knife crime. We don't, you know, our sort of gangsters may use guns, but our youth gangs on the whole don't, I mean, guns are present, but it's much more endemic is knife crime. Um, a, because they're readily accessible, B, because the, the presumption used to be you'd get less prison time carrying a knife, etc., all that sort of nonsense. But it has been an epidemic for 10 years, if not more, between youth gangs. And the protagonist sort of, you know, holds the boy while he life, you know, drains from him and then goes off in search of uh, the mother of the boy on the estate to say, say, look, you know, I held him, he didn't die alone and, and to, you know, offer their, their sympathies. Uh, but it's difficult because someone going around the estate uh, trying to find out who this guy's mother is arouses suspicion that, that the protagonist is a police, you know, undercover police or whatever. And there's a really interesting section with the interaction with a, a, a youth drug gang where they find out that this guy was a member of their, their gang because, because it's always territorial. It's always what estates and what postcodes you're on. They're called postcode gangs here in London. And that that was probably a revenge attack in killing him from one where one of the other gangs, uh, rival gangs, someone of theirs died. And it's very authentic. I recognise it. Um, you know, it's my city, and and I think it's it's really well done. But then we earlier we have a story called um, Heartbreak at the Super Eight, which is set in the US. The Super Eight is a chain of ho cheap hotels. Uh, a story starts with a guy who's fallen off his motorbike, lying there on the road, and is picked up by a woman who's got a pickup truck, so sort of, you know, gets him up and puts his bike in the back, and sort of, you know, scoops him up and sort of saves him or, or helps him. At, and, and he stays in town, and uh, when he's well enough, he visits uh, the brothel on the edge of town, and that's where she works. He he bumps into her again. So obviously he decides he's going to pay for time with her um, and falls in love with her. But, you know, the question is, will she reciprocate? Will she be a tart with a heart? She saved him physically off the road. Will she save his soul? And they go off in the sunset happy ever after that. That's the question. Now, I have a problem with this. It's been done to death that, you know, the, the, the you know, men in brothels in the US. OK, this is done by from a woman's point of view, but it kind of isn't because the main character is through the man's eyes. The tart with a heart is a cliche and the whole American setup. You know, I don't know if uh, Onu Meze has spent time in America, but this read to me entirely how I would have written the story, not having lived in America. It's like sort of mediated by our impressions of America from books and films and all this sort of stuff. It added nothing. Um, and unlike, um, what was it called, Green Spaces or something? Green Afternoon, which read absolutely authentically, because I think the author has lived that. This thing seemed like um, 
you know, someone writing what they imagine it should be. And that's that. So the juxtaposition of those two is is why I found this was a mixed bag. I'm very brief to talk about a couple of the other uh, stories. The first, the opening and the um, the collection's name, Dark Neighbourhood Story, uh, reminded me very much of Niall Bork's um, book, The Line. Um, it's a dystopian thing of people in an endless queue trying to get towards a gate where it's, ne you know, it's never specified what's beyond the gate, but there's some sort of reason they have to do it. There's some sort of dystopian or ecological force that makes them and, and how, you know, obviously a bit like refugees, they have very little possessions. They have to make a very sort of primitive life. The two main characters here actually uh, have managed to accumulate a lot of stuff and they're selling that to other people in the line and they make quite a decent trade. Um, now, it's not the author's thought that Niall Bork has written something similar over a greater length. She may have written it before he wrote his. Who knows? I don't know. But I happen to have read Line first. So unfortunately, this story, again, doesn't really give me anything over above and beyond what Niall Bork's story is. But that's not the author's thought. That's just coincidence. And then and the story, another story I really liked was called Bright Spaces, which is a story of um, a man who I take to be of Nigerian origin. It's the day of his funeral. And it's a very impressionistic and memories from, I think, his brother of when they were sort of back in the old country, but also now in London and stuff. And it, it, it was, it, again, it, it read very authentic because it, it was slightly off kilter in its language and some of the terms it used in the imagery, this mixture between the old country and London. And I th again, I thought that was really, really well done. And just to give you an idea, he will take your ashes with he will take your ashes with him back to the continent, to a tree of his own childhood. He will put your ashes into earth, cracked like the wrinkles in your feet, cracked earth, once mud, earth and water. Earth and water with red hue like the rounded edges of your fingertips. Huh. Under a tree where the birds move in a line, making a hell of a noise as they jump from branch to branch. Think of the smell of the earth and shrubs of the bush dying away to make room for new green. Green the smell of early summer when mother would cut our hair. Me first because it was always a struggle. Daddy stretch out in the chair, best place for what he has to say, what he always says. Home, talking of home. So I thought that was really, really strong. But, you know, unfortunately, the first two stories in this did not get me off to a good start. To say, or sorry, two of the first three. Dark Neighbourhood, because I'd read something similar. And Heartbreak at the Super 8, because I just didn't buy it. So a very mixed um, reading experience, which I think is sort of almost inbuilt into short story collections. That's the problem. Um, so I gave it three and a half stars going, you know, rounded up to four. Because there was some beautiful writing, a lot of beautiful writing in this. And finally, the book of portraiture by Steve Thomas Sula, again recommended to me uh, by non booktuber one of my uh, viewers and commenters called Mitch Axler, over in America. When I I did a video called the best living author you've never heard of, and I said it was Jared Kobach, and Mitchell Axler disagreed and sort of said, no, this guy, um, who I'd never heard of. And his books are quite hard to get hold of outside of the US. But fortunately, I managed to get this through Thrift Books. Um, slightly beaten up copy, but I don't mind that. And it is a very interesting book. Um, it, it's, you know, it's called The Book of Portraiture. It is about human identity and identifying other humans and how we portray and represent humans. So it's five sections. Uh, none of the characters are sort of handed over. So the first one is a sort of, I think it's either Moses of the Bible or a mosaic, a Moses-like figure who comes across uh, the alphabet, you know, the early origins of, of the Western alphabet, which is basically sort of traded by Phoenicians to the Greeks and, 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 and eventually passed into, uh, into our modern alphabet. And he realises that, you know, he's a storyteller and he struggles to sort of gather all these stories which have slight variations from different places. He wants a definitive version. And he realises with an alphabet that he can preserve that. And also that it, it gives him infinite, because alphabets, alphabetic letters build every single word known to man. 
gives an infinite sort of flexibility. And that's a subject I'm absolutely fascinated by. And in a way, I wish it's quite, it's the shortest chapter in the book. And in a way, I wish it was longer. Uh, I felt it could have been drawn out and developed more. But then we go into perhaps the most interesting section, which is on the painter Velasquez, who was a court painter in Spain to the king's court. He himself was not of noble birth and was always, even though he was highly valued by the king, he was always trying to sort of formally, you know, become a noble. But you can't, you know, it's, you can't be invested in you by the, even by the king uh, because it's all your breeding and education and upbringing and all that sort of stuff. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff whereby at the time all painting had religious themes which therefore de derived from the Bible which is sort of set in stone you know you, you can't sort of deviate from that or you're being heretical but he also wants to introduce elements of the real of the life that he knows as a non-noble um, so he's there's this tension he's always exploring between the literal rep re reproduction of things in the Bible, which itself is already full of symbols, full of parables, not a one-to-one -one correlation to reality. So there's this constant tension of a literal interpretation of something that's not literally observable in life. So he's obsessed with the nature of representation and symbol and image. And he's actually hauled up before the Spanish Inquisition about some non-literal images such as uh, a dwarf what he, what he called a dwarf uh, which was very pertinent to him you know his own personal dreams and nightmares and persecutions but has no doesn't derive from the old testament scene that he's or the new testament scene that he's painting and certain animals the same so it's a really interesting um, uh, section then the next section is deriving the portrait of a person through psychoanalysis. So it's set in the early days of psychoanalysis, uh, an absolute Freudian with all the inbuilt misogyny, uh, receives a patient who's a 28 year old woman who's not mad, therefore she's diagnosed as a hysterical woman. And um, we get a very classical um, sort of case study really, a, a la Freud, Wolfman or, or whatever. Um, but she's she's sort of made up this person persona that she's um, uh, giving him, uh, and eventually um, he penetrates at it that it's all a set of complete lies. So we, he thinks he's got to the hub of it, and that you know that he's getting close to the truth of her. But actually, she's playing him, and it builds up to a really really funny conclusion, which I I I guess just before it was revealed. So it wasn't obvious, but it was, you know, you could see where it was heading. And it's very funny. It's a very, you know, subversive undermining of the whole Freudian shtick. But like, you know, that's that's not unique, let's face it. Um, and then we get a chapter which sort of multicast of characters about, uh, again, about the body. It's in the digital age. So one of the characters is a, is a fashion model and how her body and face are always manipulated um, in the final edit, as it were. We get lots of stuff about surveillance. Uh, there's a security guard in a chain of um, pharmacies, but he's, you know, he sets up the cameras and turns them so that he can basically be a voyeur. We get a woman who's suspicious of her husband, so she gets someone to hack his computer. So it's all it's building up all these portraits of lies and how they intersect and, and stuff and was really well done, I thought. And then finally, we get um, two uh, molecular biologists uh, in research. Uh, the woman's a lot older than the man. They're in a relationship with each other, both sexual, but also there's a sort of mentor relationship there as well. Um, and the research they're doing in their lab, they also have to give over part of their time to reconstruct the DNA to hone in on the identities of people who died in 9-11 because, you know, they're because of the sort of plane crashing into the towers and the massive explosion and fire, they didn't recover bodies. They recovered bits of human essence. And it's only by, um, through the DNA, that they could identify some of those human remains. Um, so it's, again, it's about um, portraiture, but here at the DNA level. So the book as a whole builds up this sort of 
inquiry inquisition onto the changing nature of representation and portrayal of humanity. Um, I did think it was slightly uneven. It reminded me of the uh, that Benjamin Labatou uh, novel. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was called. Uh, the the one that w went went on. I think actually won the Man Booker International. Um, I thought each individual section was interesting in its own right, but I couldn't quite bring it all together because it was so divergent between historical periods and therefore the technology and even the diction of each chapter. Um, but it's definitely a lot of interesting ideas, four stars. So that's what I've read. What I'm currently reading is The Public Burning, which is a buddy read with Courtney Ferreter and uh, Zena over at Books I'm Not Reading. And um, that's by Robert Coover, by the way. And that's going to go on throughout May and possibly early June as well. We've only not checked in yet. Today's the first check-in day. And uh, this novel, Night As It Falls, by Yakuta Alikavazovic, a French author. This is her debut. I'm two-thirds of the way through. I will either finish this today or tomorrow. And I first saw this on uh, Bob the Booker's channel. And he asked if anyone else had read it. And... Um, I'm not sure that it's that well known, even though it only came out last year. Um, but I'm very glad Bob recommended it or brought it to my attention because I'm really enjoying it. OK, uh, so there you have it. Thanks very much. Till next time.